Well, if you saw the title of the video, you know what's going on. Penn State has fired offense coordinator Mike Yersich one day after the team put up essentially nine points against uh, Michigan in a game where they had to have something. And uh, the second time in a row, big game came around and the offense was nowhere to be seen. We talked about it on the BWI Live postgame show. Sean Fitz, Nate Bauer, and Greg Pickle, I thought, did an excellent job summarizing uh, what happened yesterday, to quote Fitz, uh, I think you, you called it fearful, the way that the offense was called. I think that's accurate of what happened. So here we are. Penn State has now relieved their offensive coordinator of his duties. So just your initial reaction to all of this is happening, and it's happening very, you know, in real time as we're sitting here talking about it. Not particularly surprised. Um, we, you know, wrote in my post game column last night that this was, you know, this is kind of setting the table for a change. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, watching the big games, the games that matter, the two game season, Penn state fell completely flat on offense. So, I mean, where, where does the accountability there? Of course it starts with James Franklin, but you're such the, just the way that things looked. I mean, I wrote about it against Ohio state wrote about it again yesterday against Michigan. If the points aren't there, it doesn't matter. Like yep. it's whose line is it anyway, you know, it's a, it, it, it really is a situation where it's Penn state reference. has talent. You can see talent. You can see mm-hmm. they've wasted, essentially wasted a defense, like an elite yep. defense. One of the, probably James Franklin's best defense, I would say. Um, so it, it, it makes sense. We got word of this a little bit earlier today and it just, uh, you know, it's one of those things that you could probably see coming, maybe thought it was coming after the season. Franklin typically doesn't do this during uh, the season, but with two games left, uh, get a jump start on the search and go with it. Yeah, and, and when people like Stephen Light, who I, is a regular here on the show, said he was out on Mike Yersich, it felt like the 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 creep towards that happening, not the just the the bellwether, the canary in the coal mine of reasonable fans were tired of watching the offense not be successful this year in particular. So as you just pointed out, the setting the table for change, the change is now here. Uh, another question here in the chat comes, and that's the next question I was going to ask: Who calls the offense for the rest of the year? Who steps into the void left uh, by the removal of Yersich? It's going to be J1 Sider and Ty Howell. You know, I think it's going to be a situation where you got to balance it and we're going to see what they do with that open slot. You could see Danny O'Brien moving to a yep. quarterback coach role because um, he can always bounce back and forth with the way the rules are with the GAs now. Um, but it's it's going to be Sider and it's going to be Howell. Um, Sider is the assistant coordinator, or I guess a co-offensive coordinator by title. He's never really called plays since the high school level, but Hal does have experience from Western Illinois before he came to Penn State as an analyst. So those are the two guys that you're going to lean on. I'm curious to see what that changes. I mean, it's it's not going to be a fresh system. It's not going to be anything with two games left in the season. But, yeah. you know, we, we've seen in the past, like uh, Tyler Bowen came into the Cotton Bowl, called a really good game. So I'm going to see yep. what these guys uh, have. I, I don't really see them as potential options for the full-time gig. But at the same time, I mean, they're they're kind of the, the heart of that offensive room right now. Yeah, uh, and that's something that we'll get to. Everyone wants to know fits. Who are the coaches? Who are the people that there should be on the short list of people to contact to be the next offensive coordinator? You wrote about that at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. I already dropped that before the show in the chat if people want to check it out in the chat or at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. Great time, by the way, because you can sign up for the news, the information, the good stuff. BlueWhiteIllustrated.com, 50% off. I think I I was an idiot and deleted the 50% promo uh, from my Rolodex of things to put up on the screen. But... That's it. 50% off for a yearly subscription. A little bit over 50 bucks gets you 365 days of access. And this is when it's really important because everyone's going to tell you names, uh, but we're going to have the ones that you need to know at Blue White Illustrated. So um, we, won't, we won't get to a lot of those things, but I do want to talk about, I think, the most important thing in the next offensive coordinator, which was the important thing in this offensive coordinator. Nature of quarterback development, it was wildly disappointing with Drew Aller this season. How much of that was a factor in the decision beyond point totals in big games? That the quarterback, it felt like, never progressed and got better as the season went on. It was game to game whether or not you were getting a confident quarterback under center. I I mean, I think it's got to be one of, I mean, here's the thing. So much was bad on that offense that you can go one through five, and there's there's like things that you can break down. So the points in big games, I think that was the major one. I mean that that is flopping on a national stage yeah. and doing it in the sense that puts you, you know, you want to be in that top tier with Ohio State and Michigan, but puts you pretty far back in yep. 
the conception of fans and and that's not just Penn State fans that's fans across the country that's voters yeah. for the college football playoff so I think that that's big yep. but you've got your five-star quarterback you've got your guy and, and credit to yours since you found Drew Aller who's got a tre- tremendous amount of talent but like this is it's now or never man it's, it's not like he's a freshman it's not like he's a, a guy that uh you know has a ton of time left if he were to go with that traditional timeline that we looked yep. at that we looked at him being a three a three-year guy um so you've got to make the most of it right now and on the back end of that James Franklin has to develop this guy like this is we've talked about this a ton of times. This is the the golden goose that you have to develop if you want to continue to be able to recruit quarterbacks. Now that they've got a good one in Ethan Grunkmeyer and and we can talk about that all next week. But like it's a it's a situation where your reputation of a a club that can play offense. Like let's be let's be as general as we can be right now. A a team that can play offense, a team that can actually score points because. You know, you you see different identities all over the the country, but the ones that don't score points are the ones that are, that are left out at the end. So I think that those are the two things. I mean, the big games you you can't keep falling flat. I mean, that's yep. that's as simple as it gets. And and looking ugly in the process. And I'm sure you covered yep. this on the post game show last night. Like, yep. there's nothing aesthetic about Penn State football right now on the offensive side of the ball. Defense wonderful, everything, but on the offensive side of the ball, it's not an appealing product for fans, for potential coach, for recruits. Yeah, I, I think it's clear. So I. Fans use this term, I think, too liberally, but that performance against Michigan was legitimately an embarrassing process because Michigan decided to stop playing football in the second half and they still won the game. That's like when when the other side is going to say, we're going to play seven offensive linemen, whether or not we score points, we don't feel like you have any shot of score. They decided to throw the ball once. The ball left the quarterback's hands once and it was a pass interference. So they played for a field goal late like that's. And that's not, you know, Michigan has been conservative in the past. That that was something that was a whole nother, different animal on Saturday. Yeah. Um, we got a, a lot of people's questions in the chat. We got a lot of uh, chat uh, super chats. I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them today because we got a lot of stuff that we we need to cover here in our rundown. But I'll just try to couple put a couple here on the show. Uh, uh, Farzad Misabi says, "Thanks for the coverage. Isn't this proof that Franklin is the correct coach for Penn State? Transition for a program from depth of sanctions to borderline elite takes the step, the final step to win a natty. He's saying that moving on from a, an offensive coordinator where things are clearly not working is proof that James Franklin is willing to do the hard things in order to get the offense to the next level. The counterpoint to that fits, and I'm just going to present this to you as the, the two sides of the opinion is the commonality of six offensive coordinators is James Franklin. And uh, there have always been rumors about his influence on the offense. There have been questions about his influence on the offense. And let me fold this into my next question. The plan versus the execution. Mike Yersich gets fired for the execution of the plan uh, being poor. Was this his plan all the way back into the offseason? How much does James Franklin and the rest of the coaching staff, but specifically Franklin, how much do they shoulder in the burden of this was not a good plan for the offense to start with? Because I got some thoughts on the back end of that. Yeah, no, that's a good question because he's the guy making, what, $9 million? Like, he's got to shoulder all of it. Let's start there. Um, But but beyond that, I mean, you look at what Mike Yersich did, and you could have made this argument but when he hired Yersich, got rid of Kirk Shiraka and hired Yersich because that's the guy that he wanted this entire yeah. time. Yep. But the offense hasn't changed in the sense that like from coordinator to coordinator, I know there's there's intricacies and things like that, but from coordinator to coordinator, it's a lot what James Franklin wants to run. And he wants to run a mobile quarterback. He wants to, you know, sort of run that zone. He changed to that zone. He, yeah, you know, there's just, there, there's not much identity there. And it's just bringing yeah. in a guy to not run his system, but run something that goes with the mindset that he likes to go with. So yep. I think first off, you've got that. The on the on the other side, the Yersich side is you look at him, he went from Shippensburg and he ran, I uh, went to Oklahoma State, ran Mike Gundy's system there. Then he went to uh, Ohio State and then he went to Texas and he ran different systems of different head coaches. So, you know, adaptability is something that he's always done, but he's never really actually had his own system, I don't believe. And that was kind of like the whole that when when he was um, when he was hired, it was what does Mike Yersich bring to the table as a guy that develops an offense? And we didn't really see that at Penn State unless we did. And then that's worrisome right there if if that's what we saw. Um, (laughs) So I I, I really I I really don't know. But it's a legitimate um criticism it's a legitimate worry um as james franklin hires the next guy is it just going to be more of the same yeah i so part of this conversation is i talked about this last year when penn state was struggling to start the year that are you getting a lead guitarist to come in and play rhythm 
And that's that was kind of the way I phrased it with Mike Yersich and what we had seen from him previously, because if there was a commonality of the types of systems he ran, they were kind of Big 12 systems. Lots of zone action, lots of outside zone, which they finally got to in the third year here. They finally implemented an inside outside zone system. But if you don't have a complete idea and part of zone systems is everything, including pass plays, look the same. So they don't have that in this offense. Why is that? You know, asking uh, him to run with two tight ends and, and the identity of the offense being smash mouth and big 10 versus what he was doing. And James Franklin even said, alluded to earlier this year, like I remember hiring Mike and talking about playing big 12 ball, you know, play, calling offenses against those defenses versus here. So like the influence, I think, did he ever get a chance to run what he would have run? And that's, that's the question that I have of an open, what we saw from him was so different at Penn State than what it was previous places. Even if he was running other people's systems, vertical passing game is a is a big part of what we saw early. And the, like, it never matched. It never got together where the vertical passing of 2021 never came to meet the running system of 2023. And what you have is you have an incomplete thought. So um, why now? The question here, and I don't know that I... I necessarily agree with this adam bredeman says he thinks there's something already in the works only reason to do it during the season to be the first to offer someone i agree with that second part but why now do you think uh penn state moved on with two games left i just think it's it's coming on the heels of those results and mm -hmm. it, it seems like something that was building after the ohio state game and then nothing changed for michigan you know it, it, you can score 50 all you want against maryland but those are the two games that matter and that's i think that that's where the the change comes i do think that you know, he's always looking like that. That's something he's admitted in the past. He's always keeping track of guys that mm -hmm. are available. It does give you a jump start. It gives you an opportunity. I mean, Texas A&M did the same thing with Jimbo Fisher this morning to get a jump start on that that coaching market. But at the same time, I don't think it buys you all that much. Um, you know, it gives you a chance to sort of solidify your recruits in this class and things like that. But I, I, yeah. I don't know that it does all that much that he's going to change all that much. Uh, before the spring so like I, I i get where adam is coming from because the the pool will seemingly be deeper but like there's gonna be plenty of changes between now and then and i don't know the situation that is similar to that uh, a m situation frank asked in the chat and this is obviously going to be a part of the conversation uh the next phase of this is what what is next uh he says who's the top prospect from an elite program and this is the way i want to phrase that question because i think frank makes a good point but traditionally penn state has not gone after coordinators from other elite programs what sort of what sort of pond can they fish in and does james franklin's contract and and all the assurances and all of the amenities he got for his coaching talent pool of money does that change what he can try and seek this time when he's trying to go get an offensive coordinator so from a money perspective, I don't think it does. I think Penn State's willing to pay. Like they, okay. they were paying Mike Yersich a lot of money. They're probably going to have to buy him out and, and pay a lot of money to him. But Pat Kraft is like a guy that understands that football is like the driver here. So like I think that um, they're going to – they can pony up and pay somebody. I, I don't know what the uh, – what the hot name is. Like it, it's it's got to be a fit, number one. Like they, right. they went out – I mean Yersich was the guy that he looked to like – even before he hired Kirk Sharaka, that was the guy that he wanted. So he came yeah. on the market. He was free. I, I'm looking around. I don't see a ton of guys that are out there like that, but you know, it's, it's going to be a crazy one. Like it's going to be a situation where you're, you're finding the guys that are potential risers, potential offensive coordinators, but they're also going to be in the mix for head coaching jobs. Like that's the balance that you've got to get. So I, I, I don't know that there's a hot name. I don't know that there's necessarily one that's like really fun. Sean Lewis looks really fun. Mm -hmm. That's a, messed up situation out there in Colorado. Um, but I don't know that again, I don't know that that's a scheme fit for what Franklin likes to do. So well, I'm not asking scheme fit or, you know, fit is important. I guess what qualities do you think are important in the next coordinator? Is there something that stands out to you that was lacking this year that you think is indicative of what the next guy needs to bring? Um, because it seems like there, there is a specific fit. So what are some of the clues you're looking for things you're thinking about, about the next guy? <laughs> score some points right, right. um i mean I, I think you can fit a guy in with some of the staff that you'd like to keep around mention cider mention how a little bit phil troutwine yeah. you know I, I think you have some guys on the staff and, and act, actually hagan's i think it's safe i know people are bagging on him but i don't think he's got a ton to work with but uh right. you've got guys that are you know i think pretty good football coaches out here so be interesting to see that what i keep going back to with you know with a guy like moorhead in 16 like it was 
that was his the he, that was put his put his foot down moment says hey i got the offense like i'm the head coach of the offense manny's yep. doing that with the defense right now like be your ceo be be the guy that's above everything and you know you know it certainly take your input but at the same time this is my thing they got to find that guy they got to yeah. find that guy that uh is going to put his foot down and it's going to run his system and go with it so that's that that's where i would go with that I 100% agree. I think that that is one thing. Basically, that's a better way of saying what I was trying to say of like, how do you find a guy who has a system and he believes in it and he can run it and, and can implement it fully? And that's, a, you know, that's a part of it. Quarterback development, whatever that means. <laughs> Drew Aller, from a technical standpoint, has been developed to the point that he is the guy that you can unlock the greatness of the position with. So how do you get that? magic sauce of getting him to play confident and sling the ball in every single game to me that's whatever that means quarterback development is paramount i don't care if what the system looks like it has to be quarterback friendly mm -hmm. to that point um are you in danger of losing drew aller and or nick singleton or any of the young talent they've accumulated 22 and beyond with a situation like this is james franklin um able to keep all of the weapons in the closet and have stock ammunition for the next guy because that was a big conversation this year is they didn't have enough receiver help and um i feel like that has gotten to be an excuse at a certain point for the offense their receiver help is not that bad but with these talented players that have options because of the transfer portal how important is it to make these decisions with those guys in mind I mean, I mean, it's it's important, but it, it's easier for those guys to leave than ever, you know. So I, yeah. I, I don't think it's the the situation where you have to uh, make your hire based on your absolute per, your player personnel. I will say that. So I, I would say that it's important, but it's not something that you do. That you got to go around the quarterback. You got to make something that uh, that makes him feel comfortable and and figure out how you can feel comfortable coaching that system. Like it's it, it, it's really tough to watch this offense and like i said there's so much blame to go around people are on aller in the chat yes at, and we're going to say it and people are not going to hear it but he's got to get better like he's got yep. to improve yes but he's got he's got talent you can also see that the running backs have not played i mean i think katron allen's played pretty well but the running backs have not played to their capability the receivers you said they're okay i don't know man like they're calling the game fearful because they don't think they can win battles on the outside and yeah. they haven't proven that they can win battles on the outside so like i think there's yeah. going to be some personnel like attrition the, changes no and things like that like no doubt. I, I think it's going to happen um but i don't necessarily think it's because of the actual coordinator change yeah i, I just i think that there is a certain amount of dante cephas is if, if if your receivers are not getting the offense maybe simple i this is the part of like i, I said last night i'm going to go eat mac and cheese i'm not going to fix the offense for you but i can identify some of the problems if you're not trusting your wide receivers i think caden saunders has shown he could be a good football player keandre lambert smith is wildly inconsistent but like a good offensive scheme gets guys open without it being so hard. And uh, and those receivers have enough talent to get to get open within a scheme. And you can't rely on all of this, you know, trick plays necessarily or specifically scheme things. You do have to run basic passing concepts at some point. It just felt like at a certain point it's you're making it too hard. But that's beside the point. I think that the the next thing is um, what do you see is a timeline? Somebody asked to hear in the chat. I think that's a great question. What do you think the timeline is? Um, I think we've had a traditional timeline on these things, but we I don't think we've ever seen James Franklin fire a coordinator mid-season. So a little bit unprecedented here. What do you think there? Well, he got rid of uh, John Donovan on, I think, November 29th. So after just after the season, um, yeah. brought in Moorhead in December. Um, and then was uh, Ricky, of course, left for uh, Moorhead left. And Ricky took over as the, the, the guy a couple weeks later. So there, there's like a two to three week sort of timeline that he usually works with except for Yursich. whenever he brought in Yursich, he was it was kirk's out the door and Yursich holding for him and he walks in the door like that's how he went so there's no i don't think there's a timeline on it um before the bowl game is what i would say like december early december before signing day obviously you want to get those ducks in a row before those guys actually sign with the program but uh we're going to see how that goes but i don't think there's a certain timeline on it so the last question I have for you, thank you for making time today, Fitz. This has been, I think, excellent for uh, Penn State fans here on YouTube. By the way, if you're watching here, you're excited about the news, please like the video and subscribe to Blue White Illustrated because we're covering all the breaking news, whether it's recruiting, whether it's coaching turnover, whatever it may be, we will be here to give you the best analysis anywhere and the best stuff we save for bluewhiteillustrated.com great time to sign up there as well new subscribers if you want to find a way in just go click on the link i put in the uh, chat that'll get you to fitz's article if you're not a subscriber you can subscribe that way 
Last thing is, should Penn State fans be excited? Should they be hopeful that this time it will work and they'll find an offensive coordinator that will elevate the players and the talent uh, on the offense? I mean, that's why we're here, right? You're, there's always hope, you know? So like, I, I think it, I think it's the right move uh, just based on the way that this had become stagnant in those big games. It gives you maybe something to look forward to for 2024. I don't know that it's going to work. We're not going to sit here and tell you that the new guy is going to be the best guy. Um, but I think that it, it, it's going, anything, any change is going to give you hope, especially if you watch Saturday. I mean, like yeah. that, that, that point, you know, losing nine po- by nine points to Michigan is not a complete low point unless you do it in the most unsavory way possible. And Penn State right. managed to do that three weeks after, or four excuse me, four weeks after doing it to uh, doing it to Ohio State at Columbus. So I think that's where you're at. Like, it, how much further down can you go? You don't really want to know, but how much further down can you go? I, I, yeah. I just uh, that's that's tough. But yeah, it, it's college football. You're gonna hope, and you should hope. Like that's that's the whole point of doing this. I'm a freaking Washington Commanders fan. So like, let's, you know, let's all hope together. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at with that. There's no NFL draft to look forward to, but National Signing Day is coming up, Fitz, and we're going to have a lot to cover and talk about coming up then. Another great reason to sign up for BlueWhiteIllustrated.com so you get all of that information. Just pay yourself now. Sign up for BlueWhiteIllustrated.com so you have all of that information about the actual determination of the future, which is how many talented football players can, can Penn State get on the offense uh, between now and the start of 2024. Fitz, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Hey, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks for waiting for me. I don't actually wear a collared shirt on the weekends or during the week, so I appreciate you uh, waiting a few more minutes. We appreciate everybody in the chat. I know it's uh, kind of a dumpster fire right now, but we appreciate everybody that that comes in and, and, and likes our video, subscribes to our stuff. We really appreciate you guys uh, hanging with us. Yeah, you're the reason we can do all of this stuff. All uh, nearly a thousand of you here on an impromptu live show. So thank you. Uh, We'll be back with more on Tuesday covering all of this. I don't know how we're going to get to all of it. The Tuesday show could go for three hours. James Franklin's press conference, his uh, comments and reactions to what he uh, has set in motion today. He will discuss that tomorrow noon. So make sure you tune in. We will have those comments uh, immediately after they end a live rebroadcast of what James Franklin has to say during his weekly press conference. Uh, Until then, I'm Thomas Frank Carr. He is Sean Fitz. We will talk to you later.